this session, we will look at Ethernet switching for CCNA level. So we start by talking about what is a switch and how it operates. We will look at MAC address table and how it is built. And we will look at VLANs and trunks. And, and finally, we will consolidate our theory by going through a demo lab. So let's look at a switch. In case you haven't seen it before, this is how a switch looks like. For example, this is a Cisco Catalyst 2960. It comes with 48 ports. They're the ones you see here. And in this case, they are 48 1 gigabit ports. So you've got quite a lot of speed. And then you have some 10 gigabit ports somewhere in here. And typically this ports are used for your uplinks where you would connect to an upstream router or another similar switch and so forth. Switches can be Typically, and the traditional switches are layer two only. So they will operate at layer two. You will also have multi-layer switches and they will be operating both at layer two and layer three. So the multi-layer switches will be, so the multi-layer switches will be capable of routing packets and you can configure routing on them as you would on a routing. But on this session, we will focus only on the layer two aspect of the switches. So design-wise, where would you find your layer two switches? Typically, you will find them in the wiring closet, as we can see as an example here, where they will be terminating a lot of hosts, a lot of PCs, and maybe some IP phones and so forth. And then you will have them on different floor on a, on a campus building. Since the layer two switch operates at the layer two level, it would be forwarding frames between and hosts. We will take some example here. So this would be your PC1 and PC2 and PC3. So how would the switch be able to forward frames between PC1, PC2 and PC3? If it's not doing routing, it cannot look at the RP packets and so forth. So it has to rely on a different mechanism to identify which port is connecting which device and each of these devices has its own unique MAC address. So to simplify things in the case of PC1 we've got all A's, all B's for PC2 and all C's you guessed it for PC3. So the switch has to create some sort of mapping where it will identify or map a port as you can see here so this would be your gigabit 04 for PC1, 06 and 07 for PC3. So the switch needs to have some a mechanism so it can map the port to the MAC address of the host or the device connected to it. So how does it do this? When you start up a switch, so say for example a switch has newly booted, this switch has no knowledge of who is connected to it. You can see that the ports are up. So these ports will be up and ready to forward traffic. PC1 sends a packet to PC3. Received on gigabit 01, remember your frame will have in it source MAC address and you will also have destination MAC address. So this information is going to be used in the from the frame by the switch to build this mapping. So when the frame is received on gigabit 04, the switch will identify the MAC address of PC1 and he knows that he has been received out of gigabit 04. So he will start creating the mapping. So this would be all A's. MAC address mapped to gigabit 04. Then he looks at the destination MAC address. He doesn't know what to do with it because he has no information about MAC address or B's. So what it does being a switch, and this is acting as a whole broadcast domain at this point, it will broadcast this frame or it will forward it out of all ports apart from the one it was received from. So this frame sent by PC1 will actually be broadcasted 
out of gigabit 06 as well as gigabit 07. When received by PC3, PC3 will just see that this is not, or the destination of the frame doesn't have its own MAC address, so it will simply bin it. The frame will be discarded. Received by PC2, PC2 will respond back to PC1. So what happens here? The same operation as we saw earlier. The switch will receive a frame on interface gigabit 06 and it can see that this MAC address is actually connected to gigabit 06. So you create another mapping here. So you will have all Bs. And it carries on until it builds this mapping. So what happened to PC3 now if it's sending a frame on or an RP packet to PC1 or PC2. Once received on gigabit 07, you will have another mapping also. This will be all Cs. But there's no broadcasting of the frame because the switch knows exactly if the frame was destined for PC1, the switch will know exactly that, okay, the destination MAC address is all A's. I know where this is. This is out of gigabit 04. If the frame or the packet was sent towards PC2 or for PC2, the switch will know exactly equally that gigabit or MAC address all B's is connected to gigabit 06 and the frame will be forwarded out of this port gigabit 06. So this, this is where things will start getting efficient. So this mapping here established or created after there's been initial frames and, and broadcasts and so forth by the switch is called the MAC address table or the MAC table. It is also known as the CAM or the content addressable memory. So this is a very key topic on how understanding how the switch will build its MAC address table and how the forwarding is done. So the things that you have to remember here is that when the frame is received, the switch map the port to the source MAC address because that's the, that's the one thing that he sees, he knows that it's coming this, on this port. And when it's forwarded, if he doesn't have the destination MAC address on his MAC table, he will have to broadcast it out of all ports apart from the one he's received from. The return frame will also create another mapping and so forth. So this will give you your MAC table. So following up on the previous example, we will look at virtual LANs or VLANs, and you will hear this term a lot in the networking industry. Wherever you go, whether it's data center, security, routing, you will hear and you will work with VLANs day in and day out. So let's try to understand the concept of VLANs here. Taking the same switch with its 48 ports, We start connecting, we are on one single floor, we are on floor one, for example, this is on a wiring closet, and we've got different offices, different departments here. So we have them all connected on different ports on this switch, and they can talk uh, between each other, which is great, but we have a problem. As it is, as a default configuration, this switch will act as a single broadcast domain, that means all of these hosts or PCs are on a single domain, which means they would be able to talk together. Sometimes this is not desirable. A typical requirement will be to segregate the departments and have your accounts department segregated from definitely from the human resource department. And then the sales department would love to have the privacy as well, so they can talk among each other, but not with HR and definitely not with the accounts department. So this is the challenge. We need to isolate all these three kind of new domains that we have created. So the solution for this is to use VLANs. So taking every port here, where this accounts department PCs are connected, we will put all of these ports in a single VLAN. Let's say, for example, we will use VLAN 10 for the accounts department PC. So we will go in here and we will start just drafting our design document or 
documentation for how we will implement this VLAN segregation. So I'll put PC1 and PC2 and they both are in the accounts department. Okay, let's put them in VLAN 10. We will do the same thing for the human resources department. Let's put them on VLAN 20. So that would be PC3, we put that in VLAN 20, PC4, and it's actually it's not the PCs as such in terms of configuration, but we will be configuring the ports to be on a given VLAN. And obviously the PCs will end up being on, on that VLAN. And we will do the same for the sales department. So we will put them on VLAN 30. So effectively what we have created here, we have created three different broadcast domains where you have VLAN 10 is one defined broadcast domain, VLAN 20 is another one and 30 is another one. Now these three VLANs or the hosts, the PCs connected behind every VLAN will not be able to talk to each other. So this PC for example here would not be able to talk to a PC sitting in the human resource department or the sales department. The only way these PCs now can talk to each other is via router. So typically you will have one of the ports here going up to a router and you will start doing your routing between VLANs. So this is a very important concept. That's the concept of VLANs and how you break down a broadcast domain in several broadcast domain, which is actually a good design practice. So you limit your broadcast, your, the nodes and hosts on your, within your broadcast domain. Now let's take this design challenge one step further. You've got 48 ports here. Let's assume you have exhausted all of these ports. So on this floor one, you have used all of these ports and you happen to have another two or three floors where you also have another switch and you actually have other offices for sales. So you've got another sales department here, that would be your VLAN 30. And then you will have your VLAN 20 as well. You have some more people from HR department and then maybe you have some printers or what have you for the accounts department where they want to print. But they are on a different floor. So how do you get this host here on VLAN 30, the sales department on the second floor, to actually talk to the guys on the first floor? So the solution is to connect these two switches. But from what we can see here, we can only put or assign one VLAN per port so we can certainly not start having one link per VLAN. This will not scale very well. So the solution is to use what we call a trunk, which is essentially a link. I'll just make it a little bit wider so we can explain the concept better. So we will have, for example, a link that goes between this switch on floor one to this switch on floor two. And within this trunk, we will be transporting the different VLANs. So this trunk is actually carrying all the different VLANs that are configured on the on these switches. But how do we distinguish then? We can't just put in VLANs on this trunk and expect them to be received on the other end and for this switch on floor to make the difference between what is VLAN 10, what is 20, what is 30. So here, let's go back and make this a little bit more. So you will have your VLAN 10 and you will have your VLAN 20 and VLAN 30. And you want them to talk to the same VLANs here, 10, 20 and 30. So for a single VLAN, you will have a frame. Now, when you configure a trunk, you will be using the standard 8 or IEEE 8021Q encapsulation. 
Cisco used to have ISL encapsulation and 802.1Q is kind of the one that is used the most at the moment, is the IEEE default encapsulation at the moment. So with 802.1Q encapsulation for the trunk, you take the frame and you insert this additional tag that has information about your VLAN. This is a four byte tag that has information on the VLAN ID. So when the frames are transported, we know how they are. You know that a given frame, this is for VLAN 10, another frame would be for VLAN 20, based on this tag here. And this is the way that we can transport VLANs using one single link between one switch and another, and in fact, more switches if we want to. In the previous example, where we had our hosts connected to the switch ports here. These ports were configured, all of them were configured as access mode. In the case of having a trunk, we need to make a different type of configuration. So the ports needs to be configured in trunk mode to be able to establish this trunk and carry these VLANs. There are different ways we can configure the trunk or create the trunk is to configure both sides or on the switches so both sides of the trunk on the interfaces should be configured as trunk and trunk on each side and this will lead to a trunk being established we can also configure both sides as dynamic desirable and a trunk will be established so with dynamic desirable both sides of the trunk will initiate a wish to become a trunk. Same applies for dynamic desirable on one side and dynamic auto on the other side. So with auto, this side would be waiting for the remote side to initiate the wish to become a switch. So if you have this setup here, one end, for example, this switch, let's call it switch one, is configured as dynamic desirable. Switch two is configured as dynamic auto. Switch one will initiate the wish to become a trunk, to establish a trunk. Switch two, since he has dynamic auto configured, will actually comply. And the remaining two cases, which is dynamic auto on both sides, so both switches would be waiting for the other side, remote side, to initiate the wish to become a trunk. And then no trunk will be established in this scenario. And the same goes for this setup here where one side is configured as access. So th this simply, this is very clear, simply won't work. One side is not going to be trunk because it's access and therefore whatever the other side is configured as, whether it's trunk or desirable and so forth, nothing will actually come up. So you won't have a trunk in these two scenarios. So we will try to cover as much as possible on this kind of variation on the next demo lab.